Okay, so today uh, we continue with the uh, observer pattern. Today, uh, towards the second half could be a little bit dry. Let me warn you first, because we're gonna go over some Java code and also some Eiffel code together. I'll try to make it as brief as possible, right? But I'll make the, uh, the general lesson clear to you before we go to the code. Again, let's uh, review this particular problem here. That's what we're trying to solve. So we basically got a weather data over there observed by the web, uh, collected from the weather station. And then we got three kinds of apps, okay? As we said, we got condition, we got forecast, we got uh, statistics, okay? But of course, in general, you can have any subjects being observed by many observers. That's what you, you can have, okay? Okay, so what we got last time, very quickly, okay? The very first design is about you got different apps, you got forecast, you got current conditions, you got statistics. Each one of them has a weather data, referring to the weather data. That's the first design. There's some implicit drawback that we mentioned last time, which is every time you want to do display over here and display and display, you have to always call updates first, always. And now the problem is every time you're trying to call updates, you're basically communicating with the weather data objects, which might be very remote, right? So it will take some uh, computing resources. So you may not want to do updates as often uh, as unnecessary, okay? So you want to do update only when there's some certain changes on the weather data, okay? That's a limitation for the first one, okay, very quickly. And now let's talk about observer pattern first, which is a great improvement already. Okay, let's talk about observer pattern. Let's review very quickly, right? So it's nice to uh, uh, look at the diagram as well. The observer pattern, this, so this is a general one. We haven't applied that to the weather station just yet, but we will. So you have a subject over here, you have observer. And notice that observer here is deferred, meaning that observer cannot be used as a dynamic type. For example, over here, if I say uh, O of type observer, And then if I simply say creates, and then I would say uh, observer, and then o.make. If you try that over here, it's not going to compile at the runtime because it's uh, deferred. It's like a, you cannot use uh, abstract class as the new, after the new keyword in Java, okay, very quickly. And then one thing you really notice is uh, when you look at this particular attribute here in the observer, in the subjects, observer is of type list of observer. So that means every element in the static type, every element in the list will be observer statically. Dynamically, it can be any of the subclasses over here, right? That's what we talk about, polymorphism. So it's a polymorphic collection. Again, for almost every design pattern that we talk about so far, you have to worry about polymorphic collection. Polymorphic collection. Okay, yeah, make sure you understand this uh, concept over here. Okay, that'll be useful for your exam later. And then for the subjects, you can also have notify. For notify, conceptually, you're just going to notify every observer that's been added to your subjects, and then call their updates. So you only update when necessary, okay? You can think about, in this particular pattern, updates, the timings. Timings of updates is up to the subjects. Okay, let's put it that, like that, okay? I like the first design, okay? You got some subclasses over here as well, okay? And now, it's still the observer pattern, but now we are trying to elaborate on that. So now it's applied to the weather uh, station problem, okay? We still got subject here, we still got observer here, okay? It's still observer, it's a list of observer over here, okay? Just make sure you see that, observer. And then we got weather data here, which is a concrete subject, it's a descendant of subject, okay? And for observer, now surprisingly, we got forecast, we got current conditions, we got statistics. So you can see they are effective. So now it's really important to note what features do they implement. The feature they implement is the updates, okay? So now the update you can see at the observer level is deferred. So that means this is to be implemented, implemented by individual app descendants because each uh, app might be updated differently, okay? Good. All right, and then finally, the notify, we're gonna see exactly how the code will look like when we see the code, okay? Guys, any question about this? Yes? Should the subject be also like a deferred class? 
the subject should, should that be a deferred class? I would say it's more like a design decision. Okay. Yeah, the question was the subject over here, should it be effective or deferred? Okay. I would say if you move that to be deferred, it wouldn't be wrong. Okay. If you make it deferred, that simply means you don't want to allow subject to be a dynamic type for your objects. That, that's also valid design. I would say either keep it effective or defer is okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's more like a design decision. Yeah. For example, if you draw the subject as defer in the exam, it would it would not be wrong. I put it that way. Okay. Okay, uh, one more thing to say. Okay, I can see uh, we got client supplier relation over here. Okay, weather conditions, statistics, etc. So that's WD. Okay, of course, put a plus. Okay. Uh, later on, when we have some review session for you for the exam, I'll give you a little bit more guidance about the bound diagram. I'll mention more details, you know, based on the observations. Make sure you're okay with the exam. Yes. So, exam, you are expected to draw the bound diagram? Yes. Uh, you know, I'll give you more details in the last class. Otherwise, it will take a little bit long. I'll, I'll make sure I discuss that in the last class. Just make sure you come. Okay? And then, uh, also, for the subject over here, we also got attach and detach. Let's uh, we'll look at how exactly how these two commands will be implemented, which means every subject is able to attach or detach certain observer. So the list of, list of observers may grow or shrink. Okay, good. Okay, guys, let's look at the code very quickly, okay, on the slides. And then we'll trace some code for you. All right, first design, done. Let's look at observer. Okay, just some terminology here, okay? So in the exam, uh, I might mention turn, I would say, I'll typically just say subscribe or uns unsubscribe or attach, detach. Or I might say register, unregister. Just make sure they make sense to you, okay? I wouldn't uh, register any word that's outside this vocabulary. But of course, if you, got clar you want clarification, you can also ask me in, in the exam, okay? But at least make sure you get a, uh, I think that these are the common usage for the term. All right, and then we'll look at well, okay, that's the diagram we just went through. Okay, again, let's uh, look at the uh, code in a little bit more detail, and then we'll trace it. We got subject here. Of course, according to you, you can make it defer if you wish. That's fine. Okay. So now we got subject here. We got observers, and then we got constructor, which will make an empty constructor, and we say count should be zero. Okay. And then for attach over here. Oh, by the way, so for your lab has two. Just by the way, right? You might be wondering too. For lab test two, it would be very similar to what you were given for the exercise. That's a good thing. You also expect yourself to write certain contracts for the pre and post condition, like what we're doing here. You may have to use a cross as well. Okay, just mention. Yeah, you can check the Moodle announcement, just in case you're not clear. Okay, so now attach and detach. You can think about attach and detach as simply adding observer or deleting observer. Very straightforward. Okay, so now, the interesting feature for the subject is really notify. Remember I said the timings of updates is controlled by the subjects. So that means the uh, subject, should only, subject should only notify the observers when necessary, okay? Let's see, when we call the notify, what's gonna be called? So we simply go across the observers over here, and then we simply call, uh, cursor the item will be some observer, which can be either of the three apps, right, dynamically. And then it's simply called updates. Okay, so now, before I go any further, okay, I just wonder, can anybody try to explain to me just by looking at the code we have given so far? Specifically, this line here, okay, I'll just move my mouse over. When I say cursor the item, it is going to be of type observer, right? When I say cursor the item that updates, how is dynamic binding going to work at the runtime? If that was a given question for you. Yes, for example, let's say if the first element in the list is uh, statistics, in that case, cursor the item the update is gonna call that version in the statistics, right? That's not exactly what we will see, okay? Basically, every design pattern we talk about so far, maybe except for singleton, except for that, you can see polymorphism and dynamic binding always, right? That's a very important concept. Okay, what we'll do, uh, we'll get to the code in just a moment, uh, tracing. For where the data, so, so now, uh, this, this is just some uh, auxiliary feature you might use in Apple Studio. I'll just explain to you. Basically, what we're saying is uh, like this. We're saying that over here, you have the subjects over here. Let's say it's effective, let's say. And then we have the uh, weather station, or weather data. 
Okay, and then, well, uh, that one should be effective as well. Okay, if you look at the code, we say rename the make as make subjects. So what we're doing is conceptually this. In the subject class, we actually got a make. Okay, just default constructor. And then, in the weather data, we simply rename this guy over here to be make from subjects. Okay, that's a plus. Which means, if you really want to call this particular inherited version, you have to say make from subjects from now on in that particular class. So that is why, when you see the code, you will see over here, you will say make subjects over here. Sorry, not make from subject, make subjects. Okay, it's just an auxiliary feature you may want to use for your project or lab. Okay. All right, and then we can set a measurement and then etc. Okay, so that's about the weather data. Mm -hmm. We okay so far? Okay, good. And then uh, for observer, uh, basically you can see the class is deferred, and then we're going to say up to date with a subject. You can see. These two features over here, up to date with subject and also updates, they are both deferred. Meaning that at this moment, we simply don't know how to implement an update feature in general for every possible observer. Okay? They, they, they will have to be implemented in the subclasses. Okay? Uh, the general principle for defining a class to be deferred is like this. Okay? Let me just talk about it. You may have some question about it. It's similar to the Java question, when should I make a class abstract? The same question. So when to make a class deferred? So the architecture looks like this. Let's say I have a class simply called A. If I make it deferred, having a class deferred typically is because at least one of the features there is deferred, is unimplemented. For example, I might say feature one, feature two, and feature three. At least one of them, for example, this guy here, is deferred. It's not implemented. So let's say F1 and F3, they are both implemented. Okay. And now, having this particular class being deferred, so that means I'm expecting the following. I'm expecting that uh, all, uh, all deferred features to be implemented. To be to be implemented to be implemented in subclasses or descending classes. That's number one. Okay, number two is more about a design decision. You know what, maybe I should say that's number two. I should talk about number one here. Number two, if you're having a deferred class, that means, for example, this feature must be implemented in the subclass, okay? Let me draw the picture and then I will mention the number one. So we have a subclass over here, B, and that one is effective, right? So now that means at least F2 must, be, must have been implemented over here. What about F1, F3? I would say you have choices. You can either try to redefine F1, or you can leave it the same, okay? So now, if I simply put F1 plus over here, so that means it's inherited verbatim. And on the other hand, I can say F3 plus plus. So that means it's uh, redefined or in Java term, overridden, okay? So now let's talk about point number one. Point number one, the reason that you want to make this class defer is because some features just cannot be implemented at this level. Let's make something very relevant to your projects, okay? I'll give you one example. For example, let's say this. If I have a class called expression, and then let's say, should this class be deferred or effective, right? I would claim that it should be deferred in the following reason. It should be deferred because at least one feature should be deferred. For example, I might have something like, let's say, value. This may not be a good design, but I just want to tell you, you know, okay, I have let's say value over here. So this could be some, uh, let's say value is just another class you define by yourself, okay, value. So now, let's say this is a query. Do I know in general what a value should be for this particular expression? I don't necessarily know, because it depends on what expression you're talking about. 
if that's binary expression, you might want to, I want to add up the two operands. If that's unary, only the single operand, right? So now, let me make it more concrete for you. If I simply make it deferred, so what that means is, for example, over here, I can have addition, and also I can have, let's say, a conjunction. You want to make it a little bit simpler, you know, just to not have any typing issue. You can elaborate on the design for your own projects. Okay, let's say multiplication. Okay, so let's say for expression, we, all got, we also got another two things. Let's say we got uh, left and right being integer. So now that means over here, the value over here can be implemented, and also the value over here can also be implemented. So now we do have a very clear idea. Now the context class is at meaning that the value should be plus, and here should be multiply, right? Okay. So now that should be the left plus right, and this should be the left multiplied by right. Okay, it's more, more about a design decision you want to make. You want to make a class deferred when there's certain features you just don't know how to implement at this level. It's just uncertain. But you want to implement them in the subclasses. Okay, okay guys, make sense? Okay, all right, very good. So now, let's go back to the code. Okay, for forecast, it's gonna be very similar. Okay, oh, you know what? That's some, hope you haven't seen that yet, okay. So now, let's see how we can implement this guy here. That's important, okay? For those of you who took 2030 last year, have done this already, if you still remember. But if you don't remember, that's okay. No, actually, the weather station last year was a new lab, I believe. And, yeah, you know, that doesn't matter. That's not important. Yeah. Okay, guys, what I want to ask you about is this. Let's think about conceptually what's happening here. Okay? Conceptually, what we have is we have weather data. Okay? Weather data. Okay? And one of its attributes is called observers. It's pointing to a certain list, for example, right? I draw like an array. And then let's say we have, let's say, a uh, current condition. I'll say CD, okay? It's pointing to some app over here. Current condition. And now one of its attributes called weather data, WD. This is what we want to make happen. I'll draw the diagram to you and tell me how to write a code, okay? The relationship will be bidirectional, okay? Like this. Number one, let's say CD happens to be the first observer for this particular subjects. Okay? We want to make sure an index one is now pointing to this particular app so that I can easily call this to notify it. Right? That's number one. Number two, I also want to make sure when I was called notify, when I was called updates by the subjects, I can also refer back to this particular weather data to get its, uh, for example, temperature. So there are two arrows we want to implement. Basically, these are the two arrows we want to initialize at the constructor level for the app. Okay, having this in mind, I'll, I'll switch back, don't worry. So now you can think, uh, let's forecast is the same, okay? Let's say for the forecast over here, for the constructor, we're given the weather data reference, weather data, okay? What code should we write over here? To establish these two links. Let me put it here. Okay. The make, we talk about the make for uh, this particular uh, current conditions. Okay. The make is going to get a weather data, which is of type weather data. So now, what should I put over here in order to establish the two links? Namely, this link over here and this link over here. So, so this again, I don't quite catch you. Sorry. I mean, you think about it. Okay. Yeah. Anybody? Yes. Aha, that's good. Actually, you mentioned a more difficult one. Let's do that first. Okay. You're saying that you want, basically, you're saying you want to do this one first, right? Extending the list. 
by the current objects. Apparently, this make is for this current current condition, so that's why you want to mention current. How do you write it exactly? I'll give you a little bit hints. Remember, in the diagram previously, over here we do have something according to architecture. We got attach. We also got detach. Okay, those are the callable features on the weather data. Okay, so now let's go back there. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. My bad. Okay, let me mention again. What I mentioned was, if you recall this diagram here, uh, for the subjects, similarly for the weather data, we got attach and detach to add or delete observer. That's what we have. Okay. So now having that in mind, over here, Uma, what would be a suggestion? Somehow we want to make sure. Oh, AWD is basically just a callback value, right? It's pointing to this weather data as well. Just let me just uh, write it down. It's a simple. There's a simpler way to do it. What you're saying is AWD dot observers dot extend and current. I think that's what you meant, right? Pretty good. It's all good, except that it could be simplified to as follows. You don't necessarily have to uh, do this part over here. You don't have to get access to observer first because we got attach and detach. Okay. So now I would suggest this one will work. No, not a problem. A simpler way to do it would be I can say simply say a w d dot uh, attach and then current. So this will make sure this link is built. Okay. What about the second one? That one should be easy, right? Just by a single assignment. Okay. So I can say WD is assigned to A W D. Okay. Basically, I'm assigned this link over here. So that's why when you see the code, it's only two lines, but the consequence of that in the uh, runtime you want to know is bidirectional. And one thing to note is a one-to-many relations. Meaning that you have a single uh, subject over here which have multiple observers, one-to-many. Okay. However, what about a more general scenario which we have to worry about in a moment? Okay. Are we okay with uh, these two lines? Okay. Just make sure you're okay with that. Okay, so now after that, that's exactly what you would do. Okay, and you can simply write some post condition to ensure that. So that one I wouldn't bother you. Okay, and then to be up to up to date with the uh, subjects, all you got to make sure is the current pressure is exactly the same as weather data that pressure, right? It's up to date. Okay. okay, and the updates over here, I simply just say you will be the the same. I just don't have space. But when you see the example code, you will see exactly the same code as the first design. Okay, so that part hasn't changed. So now in the observer design, the update feature for each uh, observer is only called when you're trying to notify from the subjects. Okay. Let's trace uh, one piece of code together and to get a feel. Okay. All the other two are the same, so we don't need to go into details. I'll just trace one code together with you. What I want to do now is the class weather station it's going to do exactly the same uh, kind of setup as before, but now we're using observer's pattern. So the runtime structure will be a little bit different. It's something we want to go through. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to go to, okay, over here. Again, you have to worry about somehow how the runtime structure has been set up, right? And then to see how things are being called. Let's do that quickly. Okay? Again, sorry, the font size is a little bit small, okay, but I'll read it to you. Okay? Let's try this. First of all, we have the following uh, sub uh, observers over here. We got current conditions, we got forecast, we got statistics, right? So we got current condition, we got statistics, we got forecast, right? We got all the three over here. Let's first of all create the following. Let's say we want to create a weather data to begin with, the subjects 9, 75, and 25. Okay? So th what that would do is 9, 75, and 25. Okay, just set up the values over here, right? And then initially the observer should just be empty, okay? Just be empty. Yeah. And now we're gonna do the following, okay? Let's see each one of them. The first one, let's do a little bit more detail. 
let's say we try to do uh, the CC should be green. Okay, so now I say create cc.make wd, right? So now let's think about this uh, object that's being manipulated. cc basically is over here, and wd is over here, right? So now, remember the constructor we just worked on? It's going to build a bidirectional link that we just mentioned, right? What that would do is, okay, you can look back to the uh, definition laid, uh, yourself. Okay, that's a definition you can look at. Now I'm going to just trace it very quickly for you. Okay. What's, what's going to happen is this. I'll just do this uh, one specifically. Let's say for the current conditions, what's going to happen is like this. For this one over here, it's going to say cc dot weather data is going to be assigned the argument, which is WD. That's the first line, okay? So that means cc the weather data is over here. It's now going to point to this particular weather data. That's the first link. And then followed by that, we're going to say wd over here dot attach. And what's current? What? cc, right? right? That's the object we're calling cc, okay? Just make sure you're fine. And what that would do is you can extend the first observer. Now it's going to point to this particular object over here. Right, we're going to do this three times to build the links. Bidirectional. Okay, let me do the other two very quickly for you. So now let's think about FD. For FD over here is basically this line I'm talking about. Okay, the same two lines are going to be executed. So what's going to happen is we're going to have, so FD is here. First of all, the weather data should point to this particular weather data. And now the second observer is now going to point to this particular forecast. You can see things getting a little bit complicated already to trace, right? That's okay, that's a limitation for observers. And then finally, let's say we also got this guy here, sd.makewd, right? Similar, let me just complete the picture. And then after that, so, so now we're gonna say sd.weatherdata is now going to point to the same weather data objects and then the third observer is now going to point to, let me draw better, it's going to point to this particular statistics. So we got basically six links that have been set up, six, okay? Got any questions so far, okay? Let's just do one of them. Uh, let's say, let's just trace this particular one, which is important. How do we trace this particular code here? So this line is telling us we are trying to say WD that set measurements 15, 60, and 30.4, okay? What that would do is, it's going to uh, 15, 60, 30.4. We're gonna change the value to be uh, 15, 60, and 30.4. So now, the observers will not be updated until we explicitly ask the subject to do so. So now, what we will get is, Say WD the notify. What you could have done, you could have included notify as part of the set measurement. That's okay. That's another way to implement it. But I'm just doing that separately. So now let's only trace this code and then we are done. Okay? How do we say WD the notify? What's what's going to be involved? WD is exactly uh, okay. Do you remember the implementation for WD uh, for notify? You simply say, go across observers is observer, let's say. And then I will simply say, ob.updates. That's all I would say. That's a, not, uh, that's a notify, okay, as we said in the previous slides. So now, for the very first iteration, we are basically going to follow the link. Uh, let me just see this. Let me be consistent with the color, okay? For the first iteration, we are basically focusing on this particular current condition, right? And according to current condition over here, how do we do the updates, okay? Current condition basically depends on certain data, right? Uh, I didn't really have it here, but it depends on just the uh, temperature and also the, uh, uh, the pressure, I believe. And for the forecast, it only depends on the pressure. 
and for statistics, only the temperature. Okay, just a reminder. So now, question for you. When we call OB the update, dynamic binding is in the play. Because now currently, this link is now pointing to a current condition. So that means we're going to call the version of the updates on the current condition, which is going to be from this particular class. I didn't really show it here, but if you look up the definition, it's simply just going to update both the uh, temperature and pressure. So that means the temperature and pressure will be updated. So you got 15 and 60 being copied over to updates. Okay? Yes? Uh, since the current condition object has a reference to the weather data object, mm -hmm. and since we're updating the weather data object with the set measurements, would that automatically update all three since the reference is pointing to that object? Yeah, you can think about that too, but somehow you want to store also local copies for the values. Okay. So you can refer to them. You don't have to always. Remember, every time you want to connect to your weather data, you uh, take some convenient resources, right? That's the drawback from the first one. So you're only setting values mm -hmm. in the current condition object that it needs specifically. You're not getting all of them. Yeah, so you can think about this. When I say I copy over the 15 and 60, you can think about these are the local variable t uh, temperature and pressure that's stored in this particular current condition. I only update these two local variables when I need to, right? Yeah, good. Okay, guys, so we okay? Okay, for the second iteration, you're going to, uh, I wouldn't go too much into detail, but for the second iteration, you're going to go for this particular guy, which is going to update the forecast. And how do you update the forecast? You have to update the pressure, right? And et cetera, okay? You gotta run for three iterations to updates. Any questions about this? The main idea to pick up from this example here is like this. When you actually first try to uh, create each of the observer, you want to build a bidirectional link that we just mentioned, right? Each observer, for example, this guy over here, you want to make sure itself point to the subjects, and the subject points back to this particular observer, number one. Number two, when the subject say notify, you have to make sure you run over this particular list or array of the observers and call the updates on each one of them. And because of dynamic binding, when you go over them, let's say this guy first, dynamically is current conditions. So you're gonna call the updates from current condition, which will update some specific values over here. And then the second iteration is going to update forecast because it's pointing from here. And the third uh, iteration will update the statistics, etc. right? So these are the two points to uh, notice for observers. It's not too complicated, but you can see the runtime links already got a little bit sophisticated, right? You got bidirectional, it also depends on how many observers you have. Imagine if you have, if you have multiple subjects, that could be even more complicated, right? That's something we'll talk about after observer. Any questions about observers? You okay? All right. What's the limitation? What we just talked about for observer, it works pretty well. One to many relationship, okay? One single subject and you got multiple observers. It works pretty well, okay? Not, no criticism. However, if you try to extend the context a little bit, let's say the following scenario for many to many. We got multiple subjects. We also got multiple observers, okay? Let me describe the problem to you in, in English first, and then we talk about how things might work at runtime. Okay, let's see if you can understand this, okay? Just imagine, if you cannot, don't, don't worry, I will explain to you. You got, wet, you got multiple weather data, just rather than a single piece of weather data, multiple. And then, each application observes all the weather data. So let's say you got five pieces of weather data, somehow each app observes all five of them, okay? And then, however, when we talk about, uh, in the previous one, remember I said locally, you should really keep some values just to cache the value, right? So now, you want to make sure whatever value you cache is, is the latest one among the uh, multiple observers. Just the latest one, right? You don't really store multiple copies of the temperature. Make sure wh whenever there's an update on one of the uh, subjects, it's updated directly to the uh, observer variable, okay? That's kind of a, what the slide is saying. Okay, latest copy only. And then, 
whenever some weather data station updates the temperature, for example, you have to make sure it updates the observer right away. Okay. Uh huh. All right. Guys, I'll pause a little bit. How can the observer pattern solve this general problem here? Well, apparently, how do you create multiple observers? Well, you just call the constructor so many times, right? How do you create multiple subjects? You also create so many subjects, uh, subject uh, instances, right? Now the problem is, for every link, for every bidirectional link that uh, we talk about, it's a pair. So things will add up quite uh, in a complicated way. So now, let's uh, do some illustration for you. What you will get is something like this. Okay, I'll ask you a question about it, don't worry, to help you understand. Also has to do with your 2011, somehow, okay? Uh, okay, don't be intimidated. Okay, don't look at the question just yet. Okay, I'll help you understand it. Let's say we got multiple pieces of weather data, okay? We got M copies, okay? We also got multiple applications. Also, let's say we got N applications. So now, let's say this. Every weather data, for example here, is observed by every app over here. You can see there are three links over here because we got three apps. And similarly, for uh, uh, data number two, also you have it, it is somehow observed by all the three over here. Okay, that's kind of the runtime structure we have. Now, what's the overall complexity? Well, I show n squared, but you got m here, you got n here, right? Uh, m times n? Yeah, yeah. Big O of m times n. We talk about complexity of the graph, right? 2011. Similar. So now, let's talk about, whenever you want to uh, examine your design, think about extension. Okay? What would be the complexity for adding a new subject? Let's say we want to add another piece of weather data. What would be the complexity? m or n? n, right? Think about why. I'll draw that to you. Let's say somehow we're introducing over here, uh, let's say where the data m plus 1. Somehow it has to be uh, somehow subscribed or attached by every uh, data, uh, every observer over here. So that's why, depending on how many observers you have, big O of n. Okay? Symmetrically, what about we want to add a new uh, observer? Big O of n? Yes, good. Because over here, if I add a new application over here, let's say there's m plus 1 over here, somehow you must observe all the data over here. So now, uh, sorry, it'll be easier for you to see this way. One here, one here, one here, one here, of course, every one of them. Okay, so now what we will get is big O of m, depending on how many subjects you have. Guys, any question about this over here? So what we are doing over here is to say, of course, the observer pattern can handle many-to-many -many situation that's more general. However, things just get too complicated. Wouldn't that be nice if we can somehow, for example, reduce this guy over here to be big of one, and this guy here to be also big of one. And somehow this one here may be bigger of either m or n. You'd be very nice, right? To reduce the complexity. Can anybody think of how? I'm not talking about even, uh, just talking about in general. How can we somehow still make the links more or less work, but just easier? How about I give you one hint? I'll just talk about graph, right? How about introduce a new node? Give me one moment, I'll help you a little bit, okay, before I do anything, okay, just bear with me. Let's say, let me make it even simpler. These are the subjects over here. Let's say these are the observers. Currently, in the worst case, we may have to do this, right? One, oh, sorry. One, two, and three, one, two, and three, one, 
2, and 3. That's the current one, the big O complexity of n times n. Is it possible just to introduce a new extra node? Yeah, you may have a switch in the middle, and then how do we do with the switch? If, if they're communicating with each other, then you will like, connect them? So now, oh, let me put it this way. If you're suggesting to put an intermediate switch in the middle, do blue still directly connect to the red through the switch? Exactly right. Okay? So that's exactly the idea for event-driven design. Okay, I'll write it down. Okay? You can think about this is observers at a runtime to handle many to many. What you will get for event driven is like this. So now let me do okay three and three. Okay, so three subjects over here, and also three uh, observers over here. Okay, should be red. So now the idea would be we're going to introduce some intermediate guy over here, and then what's going to happen is. They only communicate through the switch. Okay? So now what will be the complexity now? They go of n plus n as opposed to n times n. So that dramatically reduces the complexity. That's an insight into the event driven uh, uh, design. Basically, you're introducing a switch over here, but we're going to call it events. How many events should you have in your class? Depending on how many variables should be monitored. For example, in this case, we got temperature, we got pressure, we got humidity. So there should be three events in total. Okay? So that's what we will see. And then what you will see later is the subject does not have observers anymore. They don't. What they will have is somehow whenever the subject is created, they oh, sorry, whenever the subject has to make some changes, they have to publish to the, uh, to the corresponding events. And the event is going to propagate the updates to the observer. That's kind of the workflow for this particular design. Question? Does this pattern make the observer pattern obsolete? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I would say people are still using observer a lot. That's a very good question. Event-driven design will be very nice because it's, it's really elegant. It reduces complexity a lot. However, how to do event-driven, how to implement event-driven design is a hassle. I will show you how to do it in Java. You will, you will definitely hope you wouldn't do it by yourself. Okay, I'll show it to you anyway, right? However, in iPhone, it's actually quite nice to do it. It's by using a keyword called agent. You haven't seen agent so far, right? Agent is basically like a, fun, a pointer to function. Okay, so we'll see that. Okay. Oh, just uh, uh, let me repeat uh, Tammy's question again. He was asking, would this event-driven design make uh, observer pattern obsolete? I would say yes and no. Yes, if the programming language you're implementing support event-driven design natively, so you don't have to use observer pattern. You'll be no, because you don't have choice. You gotta use observers, okay? When I show you the Java version for event-driven design, I think observer will be easier okay, to implement. Okay. Guys, any other questions? So over here, if you think about it, you got one, two, and three. You got three subjects, right? Yeah. So you gotta make sure they are subscribed to the events over here. And then you also got one, two, and three. Three observers, also three. And also here, you also got three links over here. So three plus three. There's an event in the middle, yes. Without the event, you'll be n times n, times n like in the previous yeah. graph over here. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so now let's go, go over a little bit more concept and then we'll see code, okay? Okay, what I will do is I'll do this guy here, many to many. Okay, we'll talk about complexity already. So now, oh, yes. So now it should be very easy for you to see. Okay, let me go back here. So now, overall complexity would just be big O of n plus n, okay? Depending on how many, oh, sorry, that should be m, okay? Depend on how many uh, subjects and observers you have. So now, what about the complexity of adding a new subjects? Used to be big O of n, used to be. Big O of 1? Why? Because now, if I just want, want to add a new subject, 
WD, for example, M plus 1, what should I do? Well, just publish to that event. That's all I got to do, right? So now, what about adding a new observer? Used to be big of N, big of 1 as well. Because all I do is application, and then this will be M plus 1. Just make sure it's subscribed to it. Okay. Now, what about adding a new event type? N plus 1 or N plus N, right? Now this will be kind of more costly. Uh, so that means you want to make your events, the set of events, stable. You don't want to change a lot, right? It's a little bit like an open-close principle, right? So now you rather the set of event to be closed because adding a new event is going to more, be more costly than adding a subject or observer. So now if you try to add a new event over here, let's say just a new event. What you will have to do is one here, two here, three, and four, and also one here, two here, three here, and four here, right? It's more costly. Question? Is this bidirectional? Uh, not really. It's not really bidirectional. Actually, they are very different design, quite, quite different. Uh, how about this? In the previous design for observers, in the previous design, you actually got the bidirectional link, right? Observer is linked to the weather data, and the weather data is linked to the observer. You got bidirectional link. But in this one, you don't have any direct link. You can see over here, each application only has a link to somehow the events they're subscribed to. They don't have any link to the weather data per se. They don't. And also, each weather data, they don't have any direct link to the application. Rather, they have a link to the event that they should publish the updates into. Okay. Yes, question. So if you do that, what's, is runtime going to be like, oh, two times n plus n or something? Runtime for, for which operation? Like if you add, add the new event, like entire things, runtime. Oh, I'm just saying com uh, complexity-wise. It's not really about runtime. Yeah, just com about complexity. complexity. Conceptually, once you add a new event, you have to make sure every subject, and every uh, yeah. uh, observer, somehow they are pointing to it, right? Complexity. Yeah. yeah, I would say this one should really keep it as rare as possible. Okay. Yeah. All right, so now uh, let's go over a little bit more slides and then we'll see some code. Uh, let me give you a little bit more um, uh, idea about event driven design. Each variable being observed, for example, temperature, humidity, or pressure, they are called monitor variable. Let me give you another example. Okay. If you have a nuclear power plant, for example, okay, I'll show it to you. Uh, you didn't really take a 1021, but are you comfortable with things like a sensors versus actuators? Okay, sensor means you're observing something from the natural phenomenon. Actuator means you're trying to do something back, okay? Like a light up some LED light, for example, right? Okay. So now, you can think about monitor variable is actually a very uh, general idea. For example, let's say, if this is a nuclear power plant, for example, right? <laughs> So you, you're, modif uh, you're observing its temperature continuously. So somehow, continuously, you have to make sure some sensor is monitoring the temperature level. And then some central controller, OK, this may be done as, as an embedded system, right? as you mentioned before. So it can be some embedded controller. They're going to, modify, uh, going to monitor that. So now, as soon as the sensor tells you that the temperature is too high for the nuclear power plant, what should you do? You should shut down the system. In that case, you will actually send the actuator to shut down the system, maybe. In a weather data station, even though it's not safety critical, but we do something very similar. You're going to monitor the temperature, humidity, and also the uh, uh, temperature, humidity, and press uh, pressure, thing. yeah, sorry. The three uh, monitor variable over there, and then whenever the controller is going to do something about it, for example, computer, uh, controller will be the app, try to calculate whatever they need, okay? But anyway, this diagram here, I'll just put it here for you. For those of you who might take 3342, oh no, 4312, requirements engineering, this will be quite an important diagram. I'm not sure if you're gonna take it. If you do, you will see that this diagram again, okay? I don't teach that course, but uh, similar concept. Alrighty, so now what we will do is 
So monitor variable is basically events. So now imagine that every variable we talk about temperature, humidity, and pressure. Each one of them will be turned into an event. So now here's an important concept I'm going to tell you. An observer is somehow attached or subscribed to a relevant events. And then eventually we're going to notify uh, all the updates to the relevant events. But let's see, uh, let me just see if I got any more slide to show. Okay, this is important, okay? And go over one more slide with you and then we'll see code. When you actually want to subscribe to an event, what do you have to link to the uh, events? Here's the thing. You have to somehow link the object itself and to the update operation. Let me just draw the diagram to you over here. That's the part that's a little bit difficult to, to see because that's not something you have done uh, so far. Okay. Okay, I'll give you one example here. So what you will get is like this. Let's say this is a forecast app. Now let's say current condition. You know what? Even better, forecast. When we first create this particular forecast, and we want to subscribe over here. But when we subscribe, we have to pass certain information to the events. What do we pass? First of all, forecast, what does it care? It cares about the pressure. Okay? So that means there is an event called change on pressure. That's the events. What do we pass to them? What you pass to them, in the forecast, remember there is the updates feature, update commands. Okay? Updates, and then we got some do, we got some end. Question for you. When we want to subscribe forecast into the events, do we want to execute updates right away? We don't want to. It's not time. It's not the time yet. We only try to uh, execute updates when certain weather data try to publish their update to the events. So now somehow we want to delay the execution. That's a key. The execution should be delayed. until some weather data publishes, changes. So now, what do we give to this event over here? What we give is some reference to the updates function over here. That's something we want to give that to the uh, events. Uh, the closest analogy I can make Remember back in 2031, you learned something about pointer to function, right? Remember? Does it make, ring any bell? How, okay, what's really pointer to function? So that means I'm not trying to invoke the function right now. Instead, I can have an array of pointers to functions, conceptually, in case this bothers you, right? You know, I haven't programmed C for a long time, but I just want to sketch uh, conceptually for you, okay? Let's say if you have a, a function called print, and then uh, that's how you do C, right? Let's say you simply say uh, print, let's say hello. Okay, so uh, the idea would be what you can do is you can define certain, uh, let's say execution. is simply assigned to a pointer to print, basically. A pointer to it. When you do this particular assignments, do you actually print hello? You don't. You just only store its reference for later execution. Let's say sometime later, what I can do is I can say, now I want to call execution. Okay? At this point, we're delaying the execution. At this point, we try to execute it. So there's some time lapsing over here. That's the main idea to make things work. Do you have such thing in Java? Do you have pointer to function? Pointer to methods, you don't. 
I'm just curious, any one of you might know approximation for this in Java. Basically, what I want, what I want in Java is like this. Is it possible to say, rather than executing my update method for forecast, I want to store its reference in the events. And then the event is going to, the event right now have to, as a reference to the updates, you will only call this update later when it is published by some subjects, the weather data about the up, uh, changes. Is it possible to store the uh, method temporarily without executing it? Okay. Yes, please. Actually, listener, I would say you, you definitely need some kind of listener. Need some kind of listener, okay? So I will show you one way of doing it, okay? Okay, yeah. Some, some kind of listener, yes. Okay, guys, just in case you get a little bit lost, let me just mention one more thing, okay? If you want to implement an event-driven design, you want to make sure when a particular observer is being subscribed to the uh, events, you have to make sure you pass the uh, reference to the update function rather than executing it right away. Okay? And then it's going to be stored in this particular event. Later on, when the weather data is trying to publish the changes, the event is now going to actually call whatever a uh, function that's been stored previously and then try to execute the function for updates. Okay? I'll write it down and then we'll see the Java code to get some idea. And then hopefully we can also get to the Eiffel code. We'll see. So when you subscribe, it's going to store uh, references to updates command for delay execution. Number one, okay, delayed. So the delay over here is really important. Okay, number two over here, when you publish, for example. So when a change is published, call the function, call the updates. That is store. Okay, that's how th uh, things can work, conceptually. We're gonna see how they work, okay. Okay, so what I will do is I'll show you some Java code and then we'll see how to do it in iPhone. Okay. Are ready for Java code? Okay. The main class is really about event class. That's the main class, okay. It's called events. And then we somehow do a hash table Hash table, basically, we're trying to say, you can think about the object over here is the context objects for the observer. For example, the forecast or the uh, current conditions with uh, statistics, okay? That's the object, that will be the key. And then method handle is speaking the action listener you talk about. Method handle, by the way, is a class. I didn't make it up, it's a Java class, okay? If you download the Java source code, out of curiosity, you will see. Method handle is basically like a, uh, like a reference to your method, like a pointer to function. You can think about given some particular uh, observer, you can return that pointer to function. Okay, that's listener actions, okay? That's the main data structure we're using. And we'll see how things work in just a moment. And then for the event, you simply uh, initialize the empty hash table to begin with. And then how do we subscribe? Here comes the interesting bit. We said before, when you want to subscribe for a particular observer or listener, you have to pass the handle of the action, like a pointer to the method, right? It turns out to be very weird, very, very uh, complicated to be done. I'll show you the code, okay? Oh, this, this part is okay, just add it because it got passed. The publish, that's the part. So now, if you try to do publish, over here. If you look at line number nine here, I simply try to uh, retrieve the reference to the action, right, the updates. And then I'll simply say listener actions, the uh, hash table, and then I'll get listener, right? Once I get a reference over here, I can now call this particular, uh, uh, call this particular action over here with the context objects and the arguments, okay? So this, you can think about this part is the delay execution I was talking about, okay? That's the part. Okay, so far, event is just like that, okay? We're gonna see 
when you try to subscribe from the observer side, that's the complicated part. Okay. Any immediate question you want to ask me? I want to give you just a high level view. The code is kind of uh, low level, okay? but at least you get an idea. But the bottom line is you have to use the method handle class. Okay? That's the point. Okay? And then let's do weather data. Okay? That's the subjects. So weather data, we still have the uh, temperature, pressure, and humidity. And also we got our events. So now, since we got three different monitor variables, we got temperature, we got humidity, we got pressure. Each one of them will be turned into events, each one of them. Okay? So each one of them actually got their hash table, basically, each one of them. Okay? And then we got set measurements, okay? as same as before. And now here's the new code we have to write. You see, every time if the, sub, uh, the weather data wants to set, uh, change the measurements, not only that they have to up update the values locally, over here you can see we set the temperature to be T, uh, humidity, and pressure. We also have to publish on the events. And we're going to see that very soon. What this will do, the publish, is going to go through the list of delay executions that we store and execute them. That's what's going to happen. Okay. And also we do for three of them. Okay? We will try to trace code in one complete example in just a moment. I want to go through the code, just at least to get some idea. But for the subject, you have to somehow publish the events, like the diagram we show, right? Remember the diagram here? We have to publish from the uh, subjects, right? Publish over here and publish over here, right? There's a publish, okay? So now, here is the complicated part. Because now, in order to subscribe a particular observer or app, you have to pass the reference to their function. But how do you do that, right? You got to use some facility by method handle. OK, let's say for the current conditions, we only worry about temperature and humidity, let's say. And then we got update temperature, which is going to update, well, update temperature as well, update humidity. And so now, here comes the thing, OK? Whenever we are trying to create a current conditions constructor, right? We are basically doing the follow. You're going to see the rest of the code goes like this. We have to make sure we can somehow pass the reference for number one, the update temperature method to the temperature events. And we have to pass a reference to update humidity method to the humidity events. We got two different events. Okay? So now Method handle is like a pointer to function over here, right? So you're going to say look up, well, that's just some facility to use. And then find virtual, well, for whatever name they call. Can you take a guess? What kind of information should we supply over here? If I want to somehow pass a reference to a function or a method, what should I give in order to look up the information? Basically, the signature of the method. What's the signature? Name, parameter type, and also return type. Okay, that's exactly what you will see. Okay, first of all, get a context class, and then you want to get the name of the method, and also the, uh, ooh, it's kind of ugly, isn't it? You, do you really want to write this kind of code? Not really, right? Okay, good. But I just want to show you, it works, okay? So, and then void over here is tell you that return type should be void, because the update temperature does not return anything, just void, okay? And then, what will be the parameter? Because the update temperature takes only one double. So you say double.class, right? And then after that, you will say weather data dot change on temperature. I'm talking about temperature events. And then I'm going to subscribe the current objects over here. And then UT, what's UT? UT is the update, uh, update uh, temperature method handle I just got returned over here, UT. It's a weird, isn't it? Okay, but we're gonna trace some code just to get some idea, right? Well, just how you do it. That's how you do it in Java. Okay. Okay. So what be the, what about the rest of the method? You were gonna do something very similar, but now we want to make sure we also subscribe this particular update humidity method to the events, a different events. So what you would do is got another method handle called updates humidity, and then you pass the uh, first of all the context class. Also update humidity, and also it returns void, it takes a double. And then 
you subscribe this particular uh, method, update humidity, to a different event. You can see it's a change on humidity versus change on temperature. Okay, so these are the two different events. All right. Okay, of course, you, you also need a try and catch block, right? Things like that. Once, uh, once we get to the uh, Eiffel code, maybe I'll do that on Tuesday, so you can think a little bit more about the Java side. Conceptually, the Eiffel design do exactly the same thing as Java does. However, it makes it much easier for, me, for you to present a design using agents. That's something we'll see, okay? What I want to do now is to trace the code a little bit with you quickly, okay? Just get some idea, okay? Okay, it's a very simple code I want to trace. I just want to show you that how things are being stored and how things are being published. At least get some idea, okay? And that'll be it. Uh, for now, any questions for me? Well, fortunately, you will not be asked about Java code in the exam, right? Definitely not. Even for Eiffel code, I would say, I'll, I'll talk about it maybe on Tuesday. Yeah, questions? Yeah. Could you achieve the same thing using uh, threads and semaphores? Using thread and semaphores. You, may, you basically talk about concurrency. That may not be the issue over here. So you, you talk to me offline. I'll see what, what you might do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, let's do very quick chasing with you. Okay, so what I would do is I'm going to trace line by line. Okay, so now I kind of put every class that's relevant from here, okay? The arrows basically show the dependency. I'll go, go over line by line with you, okay? And I'm focusing on basically just the current conditions app, okay? So what we will see, and then I have some diagram to trace as well, okay? Just I cannot fit everything into one slice, okay? So now let's try this, okay? Let's do step by step. So now, first of all, what we will do is we're going to create a weather data over here. Weather data WD and then 9, 75, and 25, okay? So that what that will do is 9, 75, and 25. Pretty easy, okay? Nothing important has been done. And then we are going to execute this line over here. Current conditions is assigned to new current conditions. So now, here comes the important stuff, okay? Here comes. We have to trace the constructor for current conditions, okay? Agree? That's what we gotta trace. I'll make it bigger. That's exactly the fragment of code I just showed to you, but let me simplify that for you a little bit. You can think about this part is going to be done first. And that's the second part, okay? The first part, we're going to get this particular handle called UT, okay? And that one there is going to find out the pointer to this particular method, which is update temperature, okay? That's what we're gonna find out. And, this, and then we're gonna subscribe it by adding UT into this particular calling this subscribe. Let's see how that can be done quickly, okay? So what that would do is, if you look at uh, how subscribe will do. Okay, let's look at subscribe very quickly, okay? Subscribe belongs to the event class. Subscribe, what would it do? By giving a particular context objects, okay, just to mention, it's context objects. Okay, by giving a context object and some method handle, you'll simply add them to the hash table. Let's see how this can be done, okay, quickly. Let's do number one. So we got UT over here, right? There's a method handle. If you think about it, first of all, if you look at the object structure over here, so these are the three events, object we have just created. One is called change on temperature, change on pressure, and change on humidity, right? So now since we talk about current conditions, okay, we want to subscribe to temperature and humidity, okay? Let's see how that can be done. Let's say for this particular temperature over here, so what we will do is, uh, let's see what, which one we started with, let me see. Update temperature first, okay? So what we will do is, we're going to go for change on temperature events. And that one there has a hash table, okay? Now we're gonna add a new entry to it. And then the key is gonna be the current object, which is CC, okay? Context object, CC. 
And then we want what will be the value? Value will be the method handle. Okay? So now I will simply say pointer to update temperature conceptually. If you look back to the code over here, you can see what you're doing is you're look, looking for update temperature over here, and then it's a reference. And we're simply adding a reference to there. Okay? Similarly, we also try to subscribe to another event called humidity. Okay? So now for that one there, it's going to update change on humidity. Okay, humidity over here. So now you're going to add a new row over here and then CC the current objects. And now you're going to say a pointer to update humidity. Humidity. You can see it's a very different runtime structure from observer, very different. We don't have to update the pressure just yet, because now we're currently talking about current condition. The current condition is only relevant to temperature and humidity. So it's only relevant to the temperature, which is pink, and also the humidity, which is green, right? Yeah, but for now we don't have our uh, pressure. Oh, sorry, we don't. Ha yeah, we don't have pressure just yet. Okay, I'm just I'm just taking this particular one for example. Okay, okay. So now you can see now uh, one thing to note. So these two guys are store for delay execution. That's really uh, important to see. Store. Okay, so these two guys for delay execution. Okay. We got five minutes, at least we can finish Java code and then we'll do I for one, which is much simpler. Okay, anyway, bear with me. So now let's see how we can go on. Guys, that's about the subscribing process, subscription process. So now we are done with this particular line. Now let's look at the set measurements. So now if you look at this line here, uh, we got WD uh, the set measurements. Okay, let's have a look at that. WD the set measurements and then some value over here. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's have a look at what should be changed. WD is a weather data, 15, 60, 30.4. So, 15, 30, 6.4. But these values will eventually be updated to here, eventually. But let's see how that's going to happen. Okay? In the observer pattern, we simply call it notified. But it's not the case anymore. Somehow, we have to publish, for example, the temperature, we have to publish this particular updates to this events. And this event is going to call this particular delay execution. Right? This is what's going to happen. Let's see how this can be done. All right, let's see. So now if we go to set measurements, so that's where I want to go. Okay, we'll talk about set measurements over here. Okay, so now let's make it bigger. So that's our weather data class, right? Let's have a look at the set measurements over here, okay? That's something we have done already. We're gonna go into change the values. So now, uh, let me just re remind myself what the value is. 15, 60, 30.4. 15, 60, uh, 30.4, okay? Let's just talk about temperature. What are we doing here? What we're doing is, we're going to say, if I want to publish the latest temperature, I will simply choose the relevant events as a context object, change on temperature, the publish. What does publish do? Let's have a look. The publish is actually over here in the event class. Okay, what that will do, I'll show you very quickly. You will simply go through the list of listener, like a delay execution, go through every one of them. If you got only one, just execute that one. If you got multiple, uh, execute all of them. You will simply say action dot invoke with arguments the listener and also whatever input you're given. Okay, let's see very quickly. So temperature over here is simply just 15 that you're passing, right? So now how do I do that? So now what I will do is we're saying change on temperature and then publish. Change on temperature over here. 
dot publish, and then I would say 15, right? That's the latest value over here. How is that going to happen? What that's going to happen is it's going to look for this particular event, right? That's the event we're talking about, change on temperature. Go over all the store actions over here one by one. Currently, there's only one action that's stored, right? So what we will do is we'll simply say CC is a current object dot. We have also got a pointer to update temperature. So we say CC dot update temperature. And then since we're trying to publish 15, so we'll call 15 over here. So that's the timing when we try to call this particular updates. And after doing that, it's going to update that to be 15. It's a very high level tracing over here. I didn't try to go 100% into detail. Let me summarize and I'll take your questions, okay? But I tell you what, the exact coding you don't have to worry is only for your curiosity. I make some working code available to you. But what you have to grasp will be the conceptual working for this. And once we go to the Eiffel side, it'll be even easier, I hope, okay? Let me summarize what's gonna happen here, okay? For the event-driven design, the essence of that is you want to be able to store reference for methods in order for a delay execution. So now, number one, when you try to first create this particular observer or the app, what you gotta do is you have to go to the particular event type and then try to expand their table over here to pass the current objects over here and also some pointer to the updates, okay? That's a, subscri a subscription part. What about publication part? The publication is when you try to change something on the web data, the subjects, so let's say change this to 15, for example, what you would do is you will also refer to this particular relevant events and look up the table to see what is to be called, right? You can see everything, either subscription or publication, has to go through the events rather than, the, uh, the, uh, rather than this observer goes to subject directly or the subject going to the uh, observer directly. That's not the case anymore. Always through the events, conceptually. All right. Any questions? All right. Idea here is important, okay? But when, we, when I talk about the uh, coding for agents, that's something you're expected to know, okay? Any questions? Just conceptually. Any questions? We okay? All right. I'll stop here, and then we'll continue with the uh, Eiffel code uh, next time.